If you've been following our Lenten series this spring, you know we have spent the last four weeks living into a theme that was titled, Didn't See It Coming. I will be the first to admit that there has been an abundance of things I didn't see coming during this Lenten season. I have a sneaking suspicion that may be true for you too. For those of you who may be visiting with us today, you may not know that our senior minister is on leave. And when I heard that that was going to be happening, I was, well, I didn't see it coming. And I was shocked and I immediately did what I do when something big comes ahead of me. I called all of my friends who I know pray, and I asked them to pray for me and to pray for this church. I've asked many of you to step up and to help. I've asked our choir and David and Christoph to not only bring their A game that they bring every week, but I ask for their A plus game during these days. And we have been very fortunate that everyone has worked so hard to fill in these gaps. Those unexpected things that appear in all our lives can be devastating, or they can be simply surprising, or they can be an opportunity to dig deeper and perhaps to see what we are truly made of. This fifth week of Lent falls into that latter group. Over these weeks, we've looked at four biblical narratives. While understanding those narratives are firmly planted in a particular time and context, we have been bold enough to believe they might contain embedded truths that could help us as we follow our particular life paths. Catherine read to us a very small portion of the Book of Esther from the Hebrew Bible. In addition to reading that biblical narrative again this week, I also appreciated having the opportunity to read and savor the work of one of my favorite queer theologians, M. Barclay, and their work on Esther. Like M, I love the story of Esther. I have loved it my entire life, in large part because it is one of the most inspiring stories of strong women found in the scriptures. The narrative tells us that Esther was living a simple, albeit insecure, life being raised by her cousin Mordecai. She was Jewish, but the king of Persia was not aware of that when he took her into his palace, and Esther quickly won his favor, and the king made her queen. In order to get to that secure place in life, it was imperative that Esther kept her ethnic and religious identity a secret. She would never have become queen if she had shared her background, so she kept that part of herself hidden. Not long after Esther had become queen, Mordecai heard of plans to assassinate the king, and he told Esther so that she could warn him. Even though after that the king honored Mordecai, plans through the person named Haman were already underway to kill and eliminate all the Jewish people in the kingdom. They were to be annihilated. Every Jewish person living under that Persian king feared for their life and the lives of those they loved every single day. So Mordecai came to Esther and told her of the situation. Esther was horrified but understandably reluctant to help because of the severe consequences that could befall her. She had managed to fly under the radar in terms of her connection to the Jewish community. And when this situation arose, Esther could have simply turned her back on her people and put her own safety first. But Mordecai, in his wisdom, warned her that she too would be in peril 
if anyone in the palace found out that she was Jewish. He challenged her to use the access she had for such a time as this. Esther, being unaware of her own power, gathered all the bravery she had within her and spoke to the heart of the king who loved her so deeply. She told him of the plan to kill the Jewish people and then revealing her identity to him. She asked the king to let my life be given to me and the lives of all my people. It was a big ask. It was a huge ask. It was a dangerous ask. And thankfully, the king granted her that request. He then put to death those who had planned to harm the Jewish people in his kingdom, and Esther, Mordecai, and all their people were saved. In a remarkable turn of events, the Persians and the Jews stood together against the anti-Semites. While this story is ancient, threads of it are still woven in our time and place. We who live in a world filled with anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, ethnic cleansing, and white supremacy are only too aware of the undercurrents of a world that sometimes seems to make little sense. So what are we to make of a story like this? What clues for the unexpected turns of events in our lives could we possibly find in between these words? Words that are read and celebrated by our Jewish siblings each year during the Festival of Purim, which was just a couple weeks ago. Perhaps, first of all, it's important to understand that Esther's courage was critical to this moment in time. The story as we know it would not have unfolded this way without Esther. Even though she didn't see it coming, when it came time for her to stand up and be counted, Esther delivered. With God working through her, the incredible weight of fear and grief hanging over the Jewish people's very existence was relieved and the people's mourning was turned into celebration. Now, I have never been given the opportunity to be a queen. Somewhere in my deepest memories, I remember a television show back in the dark ages called Queen for a Day. Does anybody else remember that? Just show how old you are, there we go. All the old people, raise your hands, there we go. So I don't remember much about that show because I'm sure that I was a toddler when it was on, but I do remember that there was something about a fur coat and money and a crown, which all sounded really good to me. So watching Queen for a Day in the memories as a child and watching the royal wedding last summer, that's about as close as I will ever be, I think, to being a queen. I do know a few queens in my life. We might even have some queens in our congregation, and they have taught me a lot about who I am and who they are. But no matter what our position in life is, we all face the same temptations, queen or not. Within the context of our lives, in big ways and in small ways, we are allowed to choose our well-being or success at the expense of, or at least without consideration, of the collective whole. We are forced to make complicated decisions all the time about whether we're going to rock the boat or just go along for the ride. When the waves threaten to tip over the boat, the choices become harder. Esther was cautious, and for a time she kept steady. And then in the narrative, she finally decided to bind herself to her people and their plight, refusing to skate by unscathed while they perished. 
Queen Esther had to let go of her life. She had to let go of the security of her life. She had to be ready to fall from her place of safety by stepping into the purpose that was put before her. Sometimes we can only step into our purpose when we let go of our grip on all that we ordinarily find most precious. Our achievements, our plans, our loved ones, our very selves. We have to let go and enter into a time and space of unknowing in order to ultimately find the most profound freedom and the most fulfilling purpose. Philip Simon said, in the act of letting go of our lives, we are able to return more fully to them. As I thought about this story of Queen Esther over the past couple weeks, my mind returned again and again to the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. Ardern. Even though she holds the highest office in her land, she is still a woman in a man's world. You would have thought the earth stopped rotating when she became the second world leader to give birth to a child while she held office. For most women, giving birth to a child while you work and have high positions is just part of life. But when you're a world leader, that's a very different story. She is a bit of a rock star. She's young, she's sure of herself, she's managing to be a mother and a wife and a prime minister all at once. She listens to her own instincts and moves into spaces accordingly. Some have decided she's a lightweight, but they did so at their own peril because when it really mattered, she stood up and took her place as a world leader. In the wake of the horrible tragedy in her country, hours after the massacre of Muslims at prayer, she covered her head with a black scarf and walked into the middle of suffering and pain to comfort the victims' families as she embraced and grieved alongside them. When President Trump finally called to ask what he could do to help, she simply responded, extend sympathy and love for all Muslim communities. Since the tragedy, she has led from her heart to do what is right. Just six days after the gunman killed those worshipers in two New Zealand mosques, 50 people, She did what we have been unable to do in the United States. She made a swift and grand gesture banning military-style semi-automatic weapons. Apparently, the NRA isn't such a big deal in New Zealand. When she said of her country's Muslims, we are one, they are us, she took the people many who are migrants and refugees, under her mother's wings, promising to defend them and fight for their lives and survival. And that unifying cry has become a symbol of her response and who she is. The New York Times reported that in the aftermath of the massacre, Ardern has strayed from those well-worn, usual post-attack scripts of many world leaders. She has gained international praise for her ability to mix empathy with concrete action, shaping her own path as a compassionate but defiant and decisive leader. There is no way she could have seen what was coming. And yet, in the midst of that tragedy, a pure purpose came storming into her life. I have to believe there must have been a Mordecai somewhere who said to her, perhaps you have been put here 
for such a time as this. In everything I read about Ardern, there is no mention of God, just as there is no mention of God in the entire book of Esther. And yet, God is infused into every aspect of both of these stories. It doesn't matter if we are the Queen of Persia or the Prime Minister of New Zealand or a second grade teacher in the LAUSD. When purpose passes by, we all have a choice. And if we are brave, we will have the ability to embrace and trust our own insights and intuitions about what is right. When we do that fully, we have courage, and we give that courage and strength to all those around us. We inspire others' faith in future possibilities, and with thoughtful and steady confidence, we don't have to know what the future holds exactly. In fact, we don't even have to know how to get from point A to point B. We just need the desire to do so collectively and innovatively. In these last few weeks, I have come to believe more each day that discovering our purpose is a privilege we can't take lightly, not as individuals, nor as communities of faith. When we decide to embrace the purpose that is staring us in the face, we do so as a way of freeing our individual potential, but we also do it to be able to freely participate in our collective potential, in what we can do and what we can become together. These are the things God can use for our own freedom and for our freedom together. May it be so. May it be so for each of us and all of us. Amen.